Hi everyone. All right, we're live. Looks like there's lots of you here already. Um, and I see lots of familiar faces here. So what, if you would just let me and everybody else here know where you're uh, watching from, that would be great. I see Uni's here and Celtic Tiger, Carrie Ann, Florin, Rob, Don. Uh, I won't tell anybody, Don. <laughs> Carlos, Vernon, James. Let's see. The Totma says from Poland. And Sakina just got here. Randall, Inkspill. Inkspill is, is, I guess, from, from the U.S. Vernon, uh, Vernon's tuning in from Brazil. Cool. I love we always end up with uh, not just multiple countries, but many different continents, too. I think I'm seeing at least four different continents so far. Um, Poland, Portugal. Do we've We've got Europe, South America, North America, um, and I believe Sakina's in Asia, so that would give us at least four continents right there. Um, ah, Zanoni's from California in the U.S. Randall's from the U.S. Carrie Ann's in Canada. Yeah, and Sakina's in Azerbaijan. So we've got at least there, and uni's in Finland. Lots of different places. Lots, uh, at least four, maybe we got five continents. If somebody hasn't chimed in yet, uh, often there's somebody here from Egypt, which would also then have Africa in the mix. Uh, and Dan from Cape Cod. I'm actually originally from Massachusetts, Dan. So not the Cape, but uh, another part of the state. So Hank Spills is already an international channel. Yes, definitely. Like uh, when I first started doing the video premieres, even um, everybody who showed up, it seemed like we would have al almost everybody was from a different country. So even if there were only six people, we'd have like four different countries or something like that. So which is one of the cool things about the Internet in general. Right. And YouTube. Um, so. What I had for you guys today is a bit about what Egyptologists call honorific transposition. Um, so, oh, and Nick is from Athens, Greece. Cool. I actually was just watching a video about Athens this morning. So, um, to get into this, I wanted to start out by showing you a couple of Egyptian pieces because I think it's always nice when we can see this actually on um, actual ancient Egyptian artifacts. It's my typed out hieroglyphs are nice too, in that they're very legible, right? But it's also nice to see it on uh, originals as well, and to see the variation in how they they use them. So, all right, Rob checking in from Houston, um, and Mohammed from Sheffield in the UK. So this is a set of bracelets and anklets that belong to a princess named Sithathor Eunet, who was buried near the pyramid of Sun II, so Middle Kingdom period, um, although she seems to have lived through several generations because her jewelry has different king's names on them. This set of bracelets has the name of a king from a couple of generations after Sun II, and these are in the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York today. So I wanted to start by going through um, a little bit of how we read this, because the whole topic of what we call honorific transposition will come up in this. Um, first of all, this, the first couple things on here might be things that you guys are familiar with. Um, I, I'm pretty sure I've talked about both of these first couple of things in my videos before, and you might have encountered them in some intro books and things like that, because they're very common phrases for describing the king, what we Egyptologists call epithets. So the first one, these first two signs, is what we would, in modern times, we pronounce this as Necher Nefer, and usually translated as the perfect god. There's some tweaking that can be done to the translation. Some people say good. Um, some go further with the interpretation of, of this 
associating the god with Horus specifically, and they refer to him as the younger god. Um, but Nefer is usually translated as either good or perfect, um, or sometimes beautiful. So as Sakina just pointed out also, that Nefer can mean beautiful. So this is one of the common epithets for the king, the perfect god, Netra Nefer. Our next section here, we have the word Neb, that's the basket. And then, I guess I should have pointed out in the previous one that Netcher is the flag sign, and Nefer is the one that looks kind of like a guitar, although it's supposed to be a heart and windpipe. So with Neb, that's the basket, the little striped basket we have, have here. Tawi, this is the dual form, which I talked about a couple of lives ago, um, where you have two signs that are the sign for land, which is Ta by itself, but when you have two together, that makes it two lands, and that is Tawi, the we being the dual ending. But what do we do with these, right? Because just Lord, two lands, doesn't really make sense. And that in English, we would need an extra word in there, but in Egyptian, they don't necessarily. So for example, if you put together any two nouns, so a noun, again, for those who don't remember back to the lessons in school, as you know, a person, place, or thing, um, or animal, or you know, whatever. The, um, oftentimes will be whoever is doing the action, for example, or it could be something you're giving somebody, whatever. So here's an example. We have house and we have man. In English, we would have to put the word of in between to get this for the house of the man. In Egyptian, they do sometimes have a word for that and that they put in between, but oftentimes they don't and they just put those two nouns together. And it, mean, it can, will just mean all by itself, the house of the man. You don't need a separate word in between. In English, we do, so we have to add the of when we're translating. Um, similarly, this is actually a, a common title for women in ancient Egypt, particularly in the Middle Kingdom, uh, lady of the house. So Neb, you saw I, had, I translated as lord on the bracelet, right? That's the masculine form of the word. Nebet, that T, feminine ending, then it makes it the feminine equivalent to Lord, so usually we translate it as lady. It's it's a little medieval sounding um, in the translation, but the idea is that this is somebody who's in charge and or who owns something. So lady of the house, that's a common title for women. So if we go back to this, that's exactly what we're going to have here, right? We have Lord of the two lands, another really common epithet for the king. Now where we get into a little bit of the tricky trickier word order is when we get into the king's name here in the cartouche. So you'll notice the first thing we have here you might recognize is the sun disk, uh, Ra or Ray, depending on which pronunciation you prefer. Then we have the water sign, which is an N. The sickle, which is Ma. I think I've, I've done, mm, I think I've actually done all of these hieroglyphs at this point in the videos. Maybe not N yet, but all of the other ones. Um, so the, the sickle by itself is M. Aleph. This little um, statue platform is Ma'a, so it repeats the M and the Aleph and also has an Ein as well on the end. So this is um, something that we call uh, a phonetic complements, where oftentimes they'll actually repeat sounds in multiple glyphs together, but it doesn't mean you're meant to say them multiple times. They simply complement uh, each other rather than repeating same thing with this arm here. This is an ein. So again, it's just complementing the ma'a that we already had. And then we have a t. Again, the feminine ending. Um, in this case, making the word ma'at. So what do we do with these? Well, let's start with the n. And honorific transposition is the reason we're not starting with ray. We'll come back to him in a minute. So I mentioned before, there's another way you can write the house of the man, right? With a word in between. So this is the other way you could do it in Egyptian. You could use an N, which is in technical terms, we call this a genitive N. It basically indicates possession. If you have one noun and then the N and then the other noun, we would translate this as the house of the man. So translate it exactly the same way that we did before when we didn't have the N. Um, but the N is another way you can do it. There are certain phrases they tend to either use this genitive N or they don't, but it's pretty flexible. 
um, if the two words, if nothing else interrupts them, they can usually go either way. Now, one little difference with this is if the first word, the first noun, is a feminine one, so it ends in a T like we were talking about before. So, for example, hoot I've given you here, which is a word for temple or enclosure. Then that N is not just N, it's going to become net. It also has to have that feminine ending. So you have hoot, net, S, the temple of the man, which doesn't really make a whole lot of sense, but I, I just kind of made up the sentence as an example because you're not really going to have a temple for a man. You have a temple for gods and kings, but not just for a random man. So if we go back to this, we can see that this, this is that same N that can mean of. And when it's used sort of by itself, like without something before it, before we were seeing it with things before it, right? So it's the temple of or the house of. If you don't have something like that before it, it automatically just kind of stands in for that noun. So it's like the one of, or since it's not feminine, we know it's just an N, it's not net, we could say he of. Since the gender is clear and in the way Egyptian is written, um, not necessarily always in English. So we have one of or he of, and then ma'at. Ma'at is this concept of divine order. Um, basically, the way that you should act, the way the world should run, um, etc. So we have the one of Ma'at, or he of Ma'at. But I'm not translating Ray first, because in this case, we have what's called honorific transposition going on. So we saw this word order before, right, where we have the house of the man. House comes first, then man. But if we have the house of the king, it's written differently. So kings and gods get this sort of special treatment in writing, where they move up to the front of a phrase. So in this case, if you wanted the house of the king, it's actually written with the word for king first, and then the word for house after it. Now we still translate it in English the same way, and we also transliterate the sounds in the same order. So we'd still say pair nesut, not nesut pair. Um, and that's because as far as we can understand it from um, Egyptian words that end up in other languages and scripts and in Coptic and so forth, they didn't actually necessarily um, speak it in a different order. It was just a matter of writing. And when you were writing things out, that this was um, a way that you sort of gave a sort of preferential treatment um, to gods and, and kings. It's not always universal. Sometimes you'll see a mention of a king and or a particular god and they're not fully fronted in a phrase but most of the time they will end up um, being so. So that's also what we have going on here. So this king's throne name is he of the Ma'at of Ray, or if you wanna translate Ma'at, you could say he of the order of Ray, or you know, some people like to translate Ma'at as truth or right or something like that. So you could go with that as well. You could say, you know, he of the, right of Ray. I don't think I like that one as, as well, though. I, I think I like um, order, or you could just go with Ma'at and not translate it, because it is a difficult concept to translate into English. Um, uh, Carlos, you say you had this question right before the stream. So, uh, fortuitous, I guess you were you were reading my mind while I was working on putting this together. You, you knew already, right? Um, I sent out an email just right before the live stream, and I realized as soon as I clicked send, of course, I sent it with the wrong subject line, because I was trying to get the stream up and running. And I was like, Boo. so you didn't get it from the email. <laughs> you must have realized. So, and then the final phrase on here after the name, um, the Ankh is given life, which is also a very common description for the king that will come after the name rather than before. So um, this is actually the throne name of the king that we more commonly call Amenemhat the third. So this is, um, two kings after Senwazer II. So interestingly, um, Sit Hathor Unit, even though she's buried near Senwazer II, who we don't know the family relationship. We don't know if he was her father or what. So maybe Amenemhat III was her nephew, but she had jewelry that had um, a few different kings' names on it. So it's, uh, it's an interesting set of pieces as well as beautiful to you. So um, let's just check through the comments for a moment here before I move on. Um, hi Dakota. So, um, hi Jihad. So, and, um, oh, Toothless Bulldog says, this is fascinating. Thank you. Well, you're welcome. I'm glad, 
That's good. And Muhammad likes the explanation too. Glad you guys are enjoying it and getting a lot out of it. Um, Inksville actually about Senna. But well, no, you have the. Um, I think you're you're thinking of uh, Ankh Wajit Senab, which is um, like often translated life prosperity health. Um, that's a phrase that they start putting after kings' names in the New Kingdom. I think in the later part of the New Kingdom, if I recall correctly, and then it starts being and used just wrote all the time. Um, so. And then, um, and then you see it so much that actually in translation, we don't even translate it most of the time. We just translate it as the, the acronym LPH because otherwise, like every other, you know, every few words, you're having to write that out again, especially in like court documents that, talk, that mention the king very often. It goes over and over and over again. Um, but it doesn't tend to show up necessarily in this sort of standardized titular you'll see on monuments and, and definitely not in, um, you're not going to see that in the Middle Kingdom material like the ones I was just showing you. Now this is New Kingdom, um, showing you the, the cartouches of Ramses II. Um, um, and let's go through these ones. There's lots of honorific transmission going on in these ones. Um, basically three out of four parts of this name um, have it going on. So let's start with the cartouche on the left which is the name that most of us are more familiar with. This is the part that actually has the Ramses part. So in this case, we actually are going to start with Ray. This is one case where a royal name that has Ray at the beginning is actually not honorific transposition. It actually makes sense <laughs> to have the Ray at the beginning. So in this case, we do. And this cartouche, um, I guess I, I, did, I went through it quickly. I didn't really mention the order that we're reading in, but these um, cartouches, are read from uh, right to left and top to bottom. So Ray comes first here and actually logically does grammatically in this case, but then we're gonna skip down to the bottom where we have mess. That's the little three foxtails tied together, um, a complementary S folded cloth. So again, we're not adding another S there, just complementing mess. And then the Sioux plant, the SW. So this part of his name means uh, it basically it is Ray who bore him. In other words, Ray who birthed him um, as the idea. Um, so then if we move on to this, there's um, in the New Kingdom, they start more often putting inside of the cartouches sometimes certain epithets for the king. So not just their names strictly, but they'll also add in another epithet, especially ones that say that they're beloved of a particular god. So that's what we have here. This particular sign is like a canal sign, which is one of the multiple ways that you can get mare, MR. There's like at least three different hieroglyphs that can do MR. So it can be written a few different ways, but this is one of them. This one fits nicely in this cartouche, which is probably why they picked it. So we're going to read this first before we return to that top line and read another god's name. This is where we do have some honorific transposition going on because we have Amun up in the top left there, who's depicted, but we're actually going to read the mare in the middle first. So we have um, Mary Emin, which is beloved of Amun. So you see this epithet in particular, beloved of Amun, a lot in New Kingdom King's name. So you'll see this also in, um, I think, uh, well, most of the kings. I'm trying, I was trying to think of a specific example, but now I can't remember precisely which ones have it and which don't off the top of my head. I want to say Hatshepsut does, but it might, I think she has a different epithet actually, where she is united with Amun. Can I'm, I'm in. Um, in her Hartouche. So, but a lot of them have these kinds of um, epithets that relate them to gods that are included in with the name. So now if we get into the second Cartouche, this is his throne name. So the first one we did is what we oftentimes you'll see mentioned as a nomen. It's basically the birth name. It's the name the king originally had from birth when he wasn't a king. The second one, the other type of name that also shows up in a Cartouche is what is often called a prenomen or in more 
more understandable terms, a throne name. So this is uh, one of the four additional names that the king would get when he became king. And it's the other one that can appear in a cartouche. So with this one, we're going to, again, skip Ray because we have some honorific transposition going on there with Ray at the top. And skip to the uh, Usur or Wesser, depending on which pronunciation you prefer, Ma'at. So here's another way of writing Ma'at. It's um, a seated version of the, um, what do I want to say, the personification of the concept of Ma'at. So sort of Ma'at shown in goddess form. And I kind of cut off her feather there with the box, sorry, but there's a feather on her head. Um, you can see it when the box moves next. And uh, interestingly, something, it's fun when they play with these kinds of things. She's actually holding the, the user sign. So we have um, powerful is the ma'at, or if you want to translate ma'at, order or truth of Ray. So this is the first um, part of his throne name here. We have powerful is the ma'at of Ray. This is a really common um, formula, I guess you could say, in terms of the order of words, just like um, where you usually have like a couple of nouns, one of the other, and then of Ray or something like that. So kind of similar to Nima at May, even though it was a little bit d different meaning in that case. And then the bottom part was, the, I, I couldn't really get the boxes broken out for this one the way it's grouped, so I just kind of grouped it all in there together. The ads one, that big curvy um, piece, is the setup. It's a three consonant sign. And then we have an N. And this is a, a verb form here. We have set up and, and then re is the subject of the verb. In Egyptian, this is a standard word order where you have the verb first and subject after it. Um, in English, we generally speaking do the opposite. So um, this is the set up means to choose. So in English, I would say I choose or I chose or something like that. In Egyptian, it would be chose and then I would come afterwards, for example. In this case, we're talking about Ray again. So we're, ta we're describing uh, Ramses here, Usur Ma'at Ray, as one whom Ray chose. So in other words, he actually chose him to be king. Um, again, another kind of epithet thrown in there along with the throne name. So let me just see what you guys all had going on in the chat and feel free to pop any questions in into the chat. This is another one that you might notice from the format of the slides I pulled out of um, the course material that I'm putting together. This is a, a small piece of module two. Um, so let's see. Celtic Tiger mentions that this is this is covered well in the Collier and Manley book. I agree. I, I do recommend Collier and Manley's book. Um, Uh, toothless Bulldogs, as you have the Book of the Dead, yeah, that's little things like this can make a big difference with understanding the the word order when you're if you're comparing a translation with the Egyptian. Um, let's see, Bibias talking about the um, the depth of the cartouches. Yeah, that's a good point, point. Um, and you see this a lot in Ramsey's the Seconds material. This cartouche is from Tanis. Um, but I don't know the exact, the set of cartouches rather is from Tanis. I don't know the exact find location and whether it might be a reused piece. That does happen a lot where they reuse and oftentimes will smooth down the surface over again and put a new text on it. And in general, Ramses II um, and some of the, the kings around that same time oftentimes carve extremely deep hieroglyphs into like temple walls and things like that. And... Some have suggested that maybe he did that on purpose because he reused so many other kings' statues and monuments and put his name on them that maybe he realized others would do the same to his stuff later and so to try and prevent that made extra deep hieroglyphs. That doesn't necessarily explain though why some are deeper than others here. I mean, it is of course deeper, to, easier rather to carve a, um, a circular sign deeper like that than a more detailed one such as the figure of Ma'at or something like that. Um, the ones that are smaller here tend to be more shallow, so it might be kind of also the ease of being able to really dig in there. Um, let's see what else you guys have. Let's 
the nature TV, talking about the meanings of the cartouches, yep. Um, Carlos is asking in common speaking, which name would they use? That's a good question. I'm not sure we know. Um, certainly before they were king, of course, the birth name is going to be the one that is used. Um, but, you know, one would think once they were king that people were expected to address them in a probably very formulaic and very formal way. So they probably weren't using their plain old birth name all the time. One wonders whether they would have addressed them maybe really by all their specific titles and those sorts of things. Um, maybe amongst his immediate family in private, they might have still called him um, by his birth name. Uh, but that's, you know, I don't know that we have good evidence for what people would have actually said when speaking to him. I mean, you do have sometimes correspondence sent and stuff, but that's usually has a very long flowery intro kind of thing um, to, to addressing somebody. Let's see. Uh, doo -doo -doo. Hi, David. Welcome. And tuning in from the UK. Dan asking if you could translate uh, the setup and Ray is chosen of Ray. Um, yeah, you could. If you, I, I was just translating it more literally. So if we go back to it for a minute, um, I'm just gonna get really technical on you guys for just a moment here, <laughs> and say that this form is what we call a relative sejam anaf, and so the idea is that this is a past form. That's what the n is doing there, letting you know this is in the past. Um, but it creates what's called a relative clause. Um, and so this is why, it te technically speaking, it would be whom Ray chose, because um, it's describing, a relative like this describes um, the person or whatever is mentioned right before. But it's a little cumbersome in English, right? Is it, most people wouldn't say that anymore in English. So probably most of the time it makes sense to say, um, to basically say, you know, chosen of Ray. That's, it has the same meaning. It's just not strictly grammatically exactly the same as the Egyptian. That's all. Um, doo -doo -doo. Carlos, how do they draw circles? I guess I'm not sure what you mean by the question, Carlos. Um, I would assume they drew circles probably the same way we do, but I don't know. Maybe you can clarify for me what exactly you mean. Um, Dakota, yeah, two cartouches. This is standard for most of Egyptian history. The earliest kings we don't actually have cartouches for, just Horus names. But as you go further on, they adopt more and more names. And already, um, you know, in the... Um, Old Kingdom, you already have this full five name titulary. So two of the names appear in cartouches, the birth name and the throne name. Uh, the other three appear in different ways. They don't appear in cartouches. So let's see. Nature TV, I'm saying it's Ra, not Ray. Well, you can argue about that, but um, it's a modern convention to say either Ra or Ray, and it's neither one actually represents how the Egyptians pronounced it. So I think either one is perfectly acceptable. If you want to get into the um, intricacies of how it was actually pronounced, then you have to dig into like Coptic and then moving backwards linguistically. Um, it, it probably wasn't either Ra or Ray originally. So doesn't really matter. Um, James points out that a lot of Pharaoh's names mean things like, um, like Amenhotep means Amun is satisfi satisfied, and asking would non-royal people or commoners have similar names? They do, and actually oftentimes it's very much inspired by the um, reigning king's names. So you'll find a lot of people in New Kingdom named Amenhotep um, or certain names become more popular than others. Um, 
and things like that. And in the Middle Kingdom, you have an awful lot of people named Amenemhat because that's the name of, of several, well, not maybe several is a little bit of an exaggeration, four kings in the 12th dynasty, one of which we just saw, you know, one of his, his uh, cartouches of, uh, Amenemhat III. Um, to a lesser extent, Sanwazirat, which is the other name of kings in the 12th dynasty, becomes popular at that time as well. Um, and you also have just other kinds of what we, we call these theophoric names, um, basically names that mention and honor a god in them. And you also get names like Tahotep, for example, which uh, I don't believe there was ever a king who had that name, but you do have in non-royal individuals with that name. So same as um, Amenhotep, it means, it means the god Ta is satisfied. Uh, Carlos was asking about circles, like, did they use a specific tool? I assume, like, you mean, like, a compass or something like that. I'm not sure about that. That's a good question. Um, I would assume that they probably had something or maybe even just, you know, tie a string to something at a central point and then outline with that so that you get a nice circle. Probably some of the same methods that we would use today when you're doing things by hand like that. Um... Let's see. Dakota, Dakota is coming up with birth names and and uh, then throne names. Let's see. The hat with two, Celtic tiger. The hat with two points. I'm not sure what sign you're talking about. Mm, do you, is it one that I've shown here that you're talking about, Celtic tiger, or? something that you've seen somewhere else. If it's something you've seen somewhere else, pop a link in, please, so that we can take a look. Um, Jihad is pointing out that the fear of their name being lost was very important. That's true. That people do not want to have their uh, names erased on things. So, um, yeah, so Jihad, I mentioned before that some of Ramses II's cartouches are like really heavily, like deeply carved. And it's been suggested that that's why, because he reused a lot of other people's monuments and replaced the names. And so maybe he realized that might happen to his stuff. So we tried to carve extra deep to prevent it. Toothless Bulldog asking, do I have a PhD? Yes, I do have a PhD in Egyptology. Um, and let's see. Nature TV said, I've heard some pharaoh's names were pronounced as Pat. Pharaoh Pat, I'm I'm not sure what you're referring to there. You mean their actual name was was Pat, or there was a pronunciation of a particular word that was Pat? Um, let me know what you meant on that one. Um, oh, maybe you mean oh Pat Hotep. Maybe you mean you maybe you mean Pata. P T A H is usually how we write it in English. In Egyptian, it's just P T H um, or dotted H specifically. Dakota. Oh, Dakota means Amun's. Oh, that's Amun's crown. Yeah, that's um, that's Amun's crown, which is uh, two feathers, and then usually there's like a little solar disc in there too. Um, it's just a it's a typical crown that you see on Amun, and it's a little bit weird in this cartouche the way they're very separated. Because <clears throat> normally when you see them in art, if it's more detailed, <clears throat> excuse me, it looks like all one sort of continuous piece, but two feathers kind of overlapping each other, and they don't look like they have a gap like that normally. Um, uh, Biblia, uh, Bibia rather asking about that we don't know the pronunciation. Yes, because the ancient Egyptians did not write vowels. There were no vowels. So um, until you get into um, until you get into Coptic, but that's not until the in, you know a few centuries into this era. So pronunciation was probably quite different. There also probably were multiple dialects of Egyptian, and so pronunciation would have been different, for example, in southern Egypt than in northern Egypt. But that's extremely hard to tease out just through the writing um, because they don't include vowels. Uh, the small differences that might be there aren't enough to tell uh, if it's a dialectical kind of thing. <laughs> Dakota, Dakota says I'm in the coolest. Um, Carlos, have I ever composed something in, in Egyptian? I actually, um, I haven't except for exercises that I've made up for my students. <laughs> I have made up text for my students sometimes to give them practice with particular forms when there just aren't enough short Egyptian texts that focus on that particular thing. Um, but 
I can't say that I ever made something up like just for fun. Like I don't write in my diary in Egyptian or anything like that. I have heard of people who do that, who write their diary or their schedule or their, you know, in um, hieratic specifically. I can't remember now who it was. There's an Egyptologist who, who did that, but I can't remember now who it was. Um, Sakina is asking about why the cartouches. So the cartouche is like an, ex it's, it's a French term that means cartridge. And, and actually the term just comes from, um, excuse me, Napoleon soldiers thought that they looked like the cartridges for their guns and that's what they named them. So it doesn't have anything to do with the original meaning of it in Egyptian. It's just a modern name that's stuck. And um, originally what it is, is you'll see this um, normally it's just a, a circle, a ring. Um, so usually it's just sort of a ring with that base that's tied onto it, like you see in the, in the cartouche. So you see how it has the base at the bottom. Um, and that's what we call a shen ring. So it can stand in for the sound shen when you're writing in hieroglyphs, but it's also, it's a protective, it's a protective ring. It has, it's related to protection. It shows up in a lot of scenes for protection. Um, and, uh, so it's just basically elongated to fit the king's name. And the idea is it's encircling the king in, in that protective, um, oval. Um, Toothless Bulldog asking if I might be on somebody else's YouTube channel. Well, it depends on the details. You can tell your friend to, um, to contact me and we'll, we'll see. Um, uh, let's see. Nature TV. Yes. Same as, as Arabic and Hebrew. And it's, that's common with related languages that there's no, no vowels written. Carla says he wants to write, write, uh, write, I assume write in your diary like I was talking about before, but you don't understand the word. Yeah, you, gotta, you just got to learn Egyptian a bit better first. It is. It would be a wonderful way to practice it, I have to say. I, I just have, I guess I've never been um, motivated enough to spend the time right, to write a diary in Egyptian, but it would be an awesome way to practice for sure because talking talk about a way to study actively, that would be a really good one. Um, Let's see. Yeah, Bibi mentioning the pronunciation would change. Absolutely. Um, over time. So let's see. Nick asked about the meaning of Shen. I think I answered that already. Um, it's a it's a protective ring. So Sakina says thank you. You're welcome. Um, all right. Well with that, I think I'm gonna wrap it up for for this week. I will be back again um, next Tuesday at the same time. And Ink, oh, Ink Spill says that's, uh, that's how he or she learned Latin, also was practicing that way. It's a great way to do it. it honestly, um, because I learned Egyptian in grad school, I was so consumed with trying to complete the work that I had that anything beyond that was kind of beyond me at the time. But it probably would have been a really good way to do it. Probably should still do it as practice. Well, let me see. Maybe, maybe you guys will get me to take up a new habit. Um, but... Um, Yep, um, and I see some people say, uh, saying thank you, so you're welcome. I will see you all next week. So I hope to see you then, and um, have a good rest of your week. I will have the usual video premieres at the same time the, on Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday, so I look forward to seeing many of you at those as well. Um, they're short, but it's still always nice to get a chance to check in with you guys and, and chat a bit when we're waiting for the video to start. Um, so I will see you there as well as next week on the next live stream. Thanks everybody. Bye.